uh, in this course uh, we have so far talked about various aspects of electronic design automation namely design then synthesis then the electronic physical design automation which is sometimes also called the back end design step in the VLSI design. But now we will be talking about another very important aspect of design which is testing. So, once we design a circuit, well it can be at the level of a design that means we have some kind of a design you can say design at a conceptual stage, it can be a behavioral specification, it can be a register transfer level netlist, it can be a gate level netlist or it can even be at a much lower level like a transistor level netlist or finally, we can have the finished product in the form of a chip ASIC. So, once we have a design or a finished product with us, the natural question is to verify whether it is functioning according to the intended specification. So, the goal of testing is to do exactly this. So, in the next few lectures we will be talking about the main emphasis that the designers put on the various testability aspects of a design and what are the main you can say the tools and techniques which people use. So, first let us try to talk about the basic need for testing, why we need testing in a design environment. Well, some people feel or think that the objective of testing is to ensure or guarantee the absence of faults, but I would like to emphasize that this is not true, because no amount of testing can guarantee that the circuit is absolutely free of faults. So, rather we can define testing as a process using which we are trying to determine the presence of faults. Okay? So, as we go on doing testing and as we go on detecting faults if any, we continue to increase our confidence in the proper working of the circuit. This is true because of the wide variety of the kinds of faults that are possible in a typical circuit. So, this testing is one way to achieve this. So, using testing we try to find out whether a circuit is behaving as per as our specification. So, here we are talking about a circuit. The circuit may be at the level of gates, it can be at the level of transistors or at any other level. But there is another alternative way we can go about doing this, this is called verification. Verification is considered to be an alternative to testing, but the difference is that verification cannot handle a circuit, rather it takes a design into consideration and tries to find out whether the design is working correctly or not. There are a number of ways to carry out verification, simulation based is the most popular, but recently formal methods based on some mathematical tools are also increasing in importance. So, first let us try to identify clearly the differences between verification and testing. So, this slide gives a comparative study of these two. First thing is that verifies correctness of design that is the task of verification and correctness of manufactured hardware, this is the objective of testing. Now, when you say manufactured hardware, it can be a gate level circuit which you have fabricated on a breadboard, it can be a field programmable gate array FPGA or it can be an application specific integrated circuit. Okay? So, when we are testing, we have a hardware which you can feel to which you can apply an input and we can observe the output, we have such a hardware and we want to verify the correct operation of that. But whereas, verification works on a design which is on paper, okay? so the hardware has not yet been manufactured. 
verification as I told you that this is normally carried out either through simulation or through formal methods. Of course, there are methods called hardware emulation which is primarily used to speed up the process of simulation. Okay? So, emulation is just you can say some kind of an accelerator to the simulation process. Testing in comparison, it consists of two different steps. First is called test generation, next is test application. Now, in test generation, we try to find out that in order to verify the correctness of a circuit, what are the inputs we need to apply. Okay? And in the second step, test application, we are actually applying those test vectors to find out whether the circuit output or responses are correct. Verification, since it works on a design, this is performed once prior to manufacturing. So, after we have verified design is correct, we can go ahead with manufacturing. But the objective of testing is to find out defects during the manufacturing process. So, it has to be applied on each and every manufactured device. This is the difference. Okay? Verification is responsible for the quality of the design because it will give you a confidence that the design is correct. In contrast, the testing will be responsible for the quality of the devices because each and every finished product you are testing against manufacturing defects. Okay? So, in this, uh, in this lecture, we would mainly be concentrating on the problem of testing and not verification. Of course, we would be talking about simulation, but not about something like formal verification or hardware emulation. Okay? So, first let us see that when you talk about testing, what are the different levels at which we can carry out testing. Now, it depends that at which level we have the system or the hardware manufactured and available to us. It can be an individual chip, it can be a printed circuit board which consists of a number of chips or it can be a system where a number of such boards are plugged in. Okay? So, we can of course, potentially carry out testing at any of these levels, but we have to remember the implications of cost. There is a rule of 10, this is a rule of thumb which is very much applicable to an hierarchy like this. This says that if you can catch a fault at the chip level, then it will take you or it will incur about 10 times more cost to detect the same fault at the board level and again with respect to board level system level fault di diagnosis would require 10 times more cost again. So, it says that it costs 10 times more to test a device as we move to the next higher level in the product manufacturing process. So, when you say next higher level, we are actually moving in this direction from chip to board to system. So, what this really means is that when the chips are manufactured, we have to carry out testing immediately on the chips. So, as the chips are used to manufacture the boards, you must have a confidence that the chips are working correctly. Okay? Oh, well, so this is one way to identify or categorize the level of testing chip, printed circuit board or system. There are other ways to categorize the level also, it depends on the level of abstraction at which you are really viewing the circuit. Well, a circuit can be viewed at a number of different levels of abstraction. So, there can be another kind of categorization that depends on this level of abstraction. Well, the levels of abstractions we can define are as follows, we can assume 
that the circuit is available as a net list of transistors, typically MOS transistors or as a net list of gates or as a net list of register transfer level blocks like multiplexers, arithmetic logic units, registers, etcetera. And at the highest level we can have functional or behavioral model where we have very high level functional description of the blocks and their interconnection. Okay. So, now it really depends that at which level out here that we are concentrating on because if we are concentrating say for example, on the gate level model of a circuit, then we will have to develop something called fault model and simulation model, we will be talking about this later, which will be pertinent to the gate level description of the circuit. If we move on to the other levels, the fault model and the simulation model will also vary. So, it really depends on the test engineer at which level he or she wants to carry out the testing and the fault modeling and the simulation modeling has to be done according to that. And well, well we want to test the devices, naturally in order to test the devices we have to incur some additional cost. So, let us see what are the different components of the costs that we incur during the process of testing. Okay. Here we introduce a term called design for testability. This is a very important term and this is required for the following reason. So, if you look at the modern day devices, the VLSI chips which are coming out fabricated, they contain millions of transistors or gates in a single package. Of course, the number of pins that we have for that package is very much limited. So, if someone gives you such a chip with a million transistor inside, so it will become very difficult for you to test that chip and say with a very high degree of confidence that this chip is working correctly. So, at the time of design itself, you have to put in some additional effort, so that the design will be such that during the testing phase, it will be easier for you to carry out the testing. This in short is called design for testability, these things we will be discussing later in short this is called DFT. Now, in DFT actually we introduce some additional hardware inside the chip with the objective that externally from the outside world we can test the chip much more easily. Since we are adding some extra hardware of course, we would be incurring some chip area overhead, the number of transistors or gates in the chip will increase. So, the area will also increase and yield will reduce. Well, yield is a factor which people use in connection with fabrication. So, when a chip gets fabricated, normally we do not fabricate one chip at a time, rather on a wafer which is typically of a circular shape, many chips of the same type of are fabricated at one go. Now, yield is a measure of what is the success rate, that means what fraction of the fabricated chips are found to be good. Now, it has been found that bigger the chip, more the number of components, yield will tend to decrease. And if we can somehow make the yield higher, our cost per chip will also go down. Okay. So, yield reduction is a byproduct of chip area increase. And since we are introducing some extra hardware, some of this hardware will also be in the critical path of the circuit. So, the performance overhead will also be there. Okay. These are the extra overhead for DFT. Well, but during actual testing, 
you will have to apply the test vectors and you will have to evaluate the test vectors. These are done through processes called test generation and fault simulation and these are software algorithms which are run offline on a computer. So, you will also have to evaluate the cost of test generation and fault simulation which is done offline. And finally, when the chips are manufactured, so you will have to test them by applying the tests which you have generated earlier and by, and by evaluating the response. This is typically done by using a very expensive equipment called automatic test equipment. Since this is a very expensive equipment, using this equipment will also incur additional cost. And of course, the test center which operates this ATE, their overhead cost will also have to be taken into account. Okay. So, these are the different points you need to keep in mind when you are trying to evaluate the total cost you would require for testing. Okay. The basic testing principle in its simplified form may be diagrammatically represented like this. Well, you have a circuit under test. This can be a combination circuit also a sequential circuit, it can be anything. This is the block we want to test. We want to test means we have to excite it, it with a set of input patterns. We have to apply some input patterns and we will have to observe the output response. This output response can be observed using some kind of an comparator. This comparator can be done externally or it can be done in inside the chip also, where the output responses are compared against the desired response, which is sometimes called the golden response. And if they match, we announce that the circuit under test is good, otherwise we announce it is bad. Now, in this context from this diagram, you try to understand one thing that the circuit you are trying to test, it can be a very large circuit, which means that the number of input patterns you are applying, this can also be very large, which implies that the number of output responses you are getting, that is also very large. So, you will have to keep a very large set of golden responses to compare with the output response. So, in order to reduce this overhead, we will see later that in many cases, we somehow compress the output response into a small value which is called a signature and we only maintain the golden signature, that is a very small number we can store and we compare the signatures to say or to evaluate whether the circuit is good or bad. Okay. Fine. So, before we move on to the different techniques that people use for test generation, fault simulation and DFT. The first very important thing we need to talk about is something called fault modeling. Now, fault modeling what is that? See, we are saying that we want to test a circuit, okay? but the question arises that we are trying to test fine, but we are, we are trying to test for what? Well, if we say that we are trying to test for faults, then the next question will be what kind of faults? If we talk about physical faults, then the number of such faults can be infinitely many. There can be physical parameter changes which can be continuous, there can be changes in voltages, there can be changes in the wire thicknesses, in environment temperature. There are so many different parameters which can change and the amount of change cannot be quantified they are all continuous variables. So, to make things simple, what the test engineers do? They ignore the physical failures which are actually taking place, but rather they look at the effects of the physical failure, how they are affecting the behavior of the circuit. These are called the so called fault models or the logical fault models. So, we would have to first fix up a logical fault model and using that we will have to frame our fault simulation test generation whatever scheme we want to use. Okay. So, as I, as I had mentioned, 
that the reason we use fault model is that the actual number of physical defects uh, that are encountered in a chip or a circuit are too many. Because they are too many, it is not possible to consider them each of them individually and address them individually, so that you can say that all the faults have been tested for. So, what is actually done is that some logical fault models are assumed. Logical fault models are you will see that these are some simplified fault models which are defined based on the circuit which you have. This fault models drastically reduces the number of faults, so that the problem becomes much more manageable. But the good thing is that it has been found that even if we use a simplified logical fault model, even then you will be covering most of the possible physical failures. This means that even if you are using the logical fault models, they are not bad, they are good enough. You can use them in a in a practical testing scenario with a good degree of confidence. Okay, now, let us see what are the common fault models that people have used over the years. Well, the simplest and possibly the most widely used still today is something called stuck at fault model. It can be single or multiple, we will be talking about these things. Stuck at fault models typically concentrate on a gate level or a register level netlist of the circuit. If you are talking about the transistor level circuit, you can have some transistor level faults open and short. There are some peculiarities in these fault, fault models which cannot be captured in stuck at fault model, we will see that. If you have some special circuit structures like memory or programmable logic arrays, you have some fault models which are very specific to these, but we will not be discussing this for now. Similarly, when we are talking about delays in the circuit hazards, there are something called delay faults which also come into the picture. So, there are fault models for delay faults as well. Recently, people have been talking about functional faults, where instead of looking at the circuit or the netlist which you have, rather you talk about the behavioral description of the circuit, the input output behavior and what kind of test patterns you need to apply in order to verify the behavior. Okay. When you have a net list, well you have that circuit diagram in your mind, you are now concentrating on the fault on each interconnection and on each of the component, but at the behavioral level everything is a black box. Okay. So, the level of testing is different, fine. So, let us first start with stuck at fault, because this is the most important category of faults, which is used in the industry. Stuck at fault is very simple in concept. This says that some lines in the circuit are permanently stuck at logic 0 or logic 1. Say I have a circuit like this, say there are three gates, I consider a gate level circuit. I can say that the output of this AND gate is stuck at 1. This means that irrespective of what input value I am applying to the inputs of this AND gate, the output of this AND gate will always be at logic 1. Okay. Now, this is a logical fault model as I told you, but you can also find an analogy from the physical fault model. For example, if you think of a TTL gate, now you know that in a TTL gate in the output stage, there are two transistors. So, a totem pole TTL gate, the output stage looks something like this, this is the output. Now, due to some reason, due to some fault 
in the circuit out here which is driving this transistor or some fault in the fabrication of this transistor itself. If this transistor behaves as a short circuit, then the output will always be short circuit to ground. So, this physical failure can be considered to be equivalent to an output stuck at 0 fault. Okay. So, this is just one example I have taken. Well, almost all the physical faults which are possible in a circuit can be modeled by an equivalent stuck at fault model. Of course, there are some faults which cannot be modeled, but most of them can. Now, in the stuck at faults, we can consider one stuck at fault at a time, which is called the single stuck at fault model. We can consider more than one fault occurring at a time, that is multiple stuck at fault model. Now, again single stuck at fault model is more popular because of its simplicity. Well, we will see how simple is it later. So, the question is that if we, if we use the stuck at fault model, then given a circuit, we have so many lines, these are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 lines. So, you can have 7 into 2, 14, 14 possible single stuck at faults. Now, we will have to detect all those faults. So, there are techniques called fault equivalence and fault dominance, which we will be talking about very shortly, which can reduce the number of single stuck at faults to be considered. Right now, we are assuming that we have a circuit which is a gate level netlist and we are concentrating on the single stuck at fault model. Okay? And we are trying to find out a way using which we can reduce the number of faults that we can consider. Now, let us try to address this question once more, why single stuck at fault? Well, obviously, as compared to multiple stuck at faults, the number of single stuck at fault will be much less in number. So, it will be simpler to handle computationally. Not only that, it has been found that fault coverage, which means the number of faults that are actually getting detected is reasonably good for single stuck at fault. This says that if you generate a set of input vectors, which is called a test set, which can detect all single stuck at faults in a circuit, it can be proved that this test set can also detect a large percentage of multiple stuck at faults. Well, when I say large percentage of multiple stuck at faults, it can be as high as 99.5 percent. So, this is not a very bad figure. Because of this, single stuck at fault has become so popular and most of the industry people, they indeed use single stuck at fault model for testing purposes. So, let us now concentrate on single stuck at fault. Single stuck at fault as I as I told you there are three properties, this I have already mentioned. Since it is single fault, only one line is faulty at a time. Now, when you say faulty, since it is stuck at, the line is permanently set to 0 or to 1. So, when I say permanently, it means that the fault is not of intermediate nature. Intermediate means it appears sometimes, it does not appear sometime. So, we assume that whenever we apply a test vector, the fault is present. Okay? So, it can be detected any time we apply the test vector. And the faults can occur at the input or the output of a gate. Suppose, we have a gate like this, we can have a stuck at fault on this input, on this input or on the output. Now, it can be a gate or it can be it can be a module at a higher level also. Okay? In general, it can be a module. So, you can easily see that if there are k number of interconnecting lines in a circuit, the total number of single stuck at faults will be 2 k, because each line can be stuck at 0, stuck at 1 and one fault occurring at a time, there are 2 k possible faults. 
and this is most widely used as I mentioned. So, let us take an example. So, here we have a NAND gate implementation of a two input XOR gate. This is the NAND implementation of a two input XOR. Now, as a, as a matter of convention you see in this circuit here or also here, there is some places where we have a fan out. From a line you have two branches going out to two different gates. Okay. So, if you have a scenario like this, then these three are considered to be three different lines the reason we consider them to be different is as follows. There can be a fault inside this gate, so that the output is always stuck at 0 or stuck at 1. So, if a fault like that happens, that fault will equally affect both the gates. So, this can be considered to be equivalent to a fault here. But if there is a fault in the input of this gate, for example, there is a disconnection. Well, in a TTL gate, you know if a line is open circuit, it is treated as a logic high. So, in that case, the fault will appear here, but not here or here, similarly here. So, whenever there is a fan out, because of the physical nature of the fault, we have to consider these three faults separately. So, in this circuit, you can see that there are so many fault sites 1, 2, there is a fan out. So, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, again a fan out 8, 9, 10, 11 and 12. So, there are 12 fault sites and since we can have stuck at 0, stuck at 1 in all these point point fault sites, we can have 24 single stuck at faults in this circuit. Okay. Well, now we will see that that out of this 24 for example, in this uh, this example circuit, we can eliminate many of the faults, because they are not required to be tested. We can reduce the number of faults to be tested from 24 to a smaller number. Now, we come to the notion of a concept called fault equivalence. Fault equivalence is a mechanism using which we can find out two faults whose effects on the circuit are identical. Now, if there are two faults whose effects are identical, we can delete one fault from our list, we can concentrate on only one. Okay. So, this is the idea. Now, now in a gate level circuit as I had said, the number of fault sites are number of primary inputs plus number of gates plus the number of fan out branches as I just ex explained, because a gate will contribute to one fault site. If there are two fan outs, there will be two more fault sites. Okay. So, number of fan out branches will get added. Okay. Now, fault equivalent the definition says that two faults f 1 and f 2, they will be said to be equivalent if all test patterns that detect f 1 also detect f 2. Okay, here, now let us try to clarify one point, what do we mean by test that detect a fault? Suppose, I have a circuit and I am applying a test pattern to the circuit. Suppose, in the absence of a fault, the output value is 0. Now, a particular fault f 1 occurs in the circuit. Now, if the fault f 1 is present, the output is 1. Then I say that this particular test vector will be detecting the fault f 1, which means that the output of the circuit, the good value and the faulty value must be different only then we say that the particular fault will get detected by the test vector we are applying. Okay. Now, here we take an example of an AND gate. 
let us say, let us take a 3 input AND gate, A, B, C, output is F. Well, this statement says that the input line stuck at 0 and the output line stuck at 0 are equivalent. Why? Because if you, if any of these input lines are stuck at 0, the output will obviously be 1. Similarly, if the output is stuck at 0, then also it will be, sorry, the output will be 0. Similarly, if the output is stuck at 0, then also it will be 0. So, if any of these 4 faults occur, the output value will be the same. So, instead of considering these 4 faults, we take any one of these 4. Say for example, we only consider f stuck at 0 fault and we delete the a stuck at 0, b stuck at 0 and c stuck at 0 from our consideration. Okay. So, in this example, this a 0, b 0, c 0 and f 0, these 4 faults are equivalent. Okay. So, if we find out such sets of equivalent faults, the next step we carry out is something called fault collapsing. Now, fault collapsing says that we have the equivalent subsets. Say we have one subset where for example, these 4 faults are identical. You can have another subset where you can find out there are 3 faults which are identical. Now, what do you say that you take each of these equivalent subsets, retain one, delete the others. It means you collapse all the faults that belong to one subset into any one representative member of that subset. So, a collapsed fault set will contain one fault from each equivalent subset. So, fault collapsing is a pre-processing step. And using fault collapsing, you can drastically reduce the number of faults that need to be considered, because reducing this number of fault will help you in carrying out fault simulation and, and also test generation and also during testing. So, the number of test patterns also gets reduced. Okay. So, let us try to frame some rules using which you can carry out this kind of fault collapsing. Okay. So, I have a slide out here which shows all the popular gates and their impacts with respect to fault equivalence. Well, without loss of generality, we, we are considering two input gates. Well, you can easily extend them to gates of any number of inputs. Okay. First, let us consider an AND gate. Well, AND gate input can be stuck at 0, stuck at 1 this line also stuck at 0, stuck at 1, output also stuck at 0, stuck at 1. So, there are 6 possible faults in this AND gate. Now, as this dotted line shows, these 3 faults are equivalent. So, in AND gate, you can delete any 2 of them and retain only 1. Say for example, we can delete this stuck at 0, we can delete this stuck at 0, we can retain only the output stuck at 0. So, in an AND gate from 6, we have got down to 4 faults 1, 2, 3 and 4. Similarly, for our OR gate, the input stuck at 1 and the output stuck at 1 are equivalent, because if any of the input lines are at 1, the output will also be at 1. Okay. So, just, just in a similar way as, comp, uh, as in this AND gate, here also these 3 faults will belong to the equivalent subset and you can delete any 2 of them and you can keep 1. Okay. Similarly, for a NAND gate, the stuck at 0 in the input and stuck at 1 in the output are equivalent, because if the inputs are stuck at 0, the output will be 1. Okay. So, here again you can define this equivalent subset 
and you can delete these two. Similarly, for a NOR, stuck at 1 in the input and stuck at 0 in the output are equivalent. So, you can delete the stuck at 1s in the input. So, what the rule says? The rule says for AND and NAND, you can ignore the stuck at 0 faults in the inputs. For OR and NOR, you can ignore the stuck at 1 faults in the inputs. But in NOT, well, NOT is also simple stuck at 0 in the input is equivalent to stuck at 1 in the output. This is one equivalent set and stuck at 1 here and stuck at 0, this is another equivalent set. So, from this equivalent set you can delete 1, from this set again you can delete 1. So, from NOT you can delete all faults from the inputs. If there is a fan out, there are no equivalents here. So, for a fan out you cannot delete anything. But if it is a simple interconnecting wire, trivially these faults will be equivalent. So, you take the faults at any one end of the wire, they are the same. So, using these simple equivalence rules, you can reduce the number of faults that need to be considered in a circuit. So, let us take an example to illustrate this. Suppose we have a circuit like this, this circuit consists of only AND and OR gates. Now, just from the rules that we had mentioned, we, we can start doing the thing. Say, this is an AND gate, we can delete this stuck at 0 faults in the inputs. This is another AND gate, stuck at 0, stuck at 0, you delete. This is another AND stuck at 0, stuck at 0. These are OR, so the stuck at 1 faults you delete, stuck at 1, stuck at 1, stuck at 1, stuck at 1. This is AND, stuck at 0, stuck at 0. These are fan out branches, you cannot delete anything. So, in this circuit, how many lines were there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 and 16. So, there were 32 faults total. Out of them, we have deleted 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So, we are left with 20 faults. This ratio is sometimes called the collapse ratio, that using fault equivalence we can reduce the number of faults to about 62 percent of the original. Okay. So, this fault equivalence is a very useful technique which is used to reduce or decrease the number of faults that need to be considered in a circuit. Uh, there is another technique which can also be used to read to mean say you can say remove some of the faults. Fault equivalence is one technique we have just mentioned. There is another method called fault dominance. Fault dominance here the concept is that one fault dominates the other. Now, if there is a dominance relationship, then one of the fault can be removed. How? Let us see. The definition of dominance says that suppose we have two faults F1 and F2. If all test vectors that detect fault F 1 also detect fault F 2, then we can say F 2 dominates F 1. So, what does this mean? If we generate any test vector to detect fault F 1, that test vector will also detect F 2. So, why not we remove F 2 from consideration, we can delete F 2 we take only F 1 and we try to find out a test for F 1. Okay. So, dominance fault collapsing says, if a fault F 2 dominates F 1, then F 2 can be removed from the fault list. Okay. Well, this point I will come to later, but first let us uh, try to give an example of this. 
let us take a simple example of a 3 input AND gate. 3 input AND gate with two faults F 1 and F 2. So, F 1 is this say uh, these are A, B, C the inputs, this is the F. So, this F 1 is A stuck at 1 and F 2 is this output F is stuck at 1. Now, let us try to find out that what are the test vectors that are used to detect fault F 1. Let us try to understand this first. For fault F 1, what input we need to apply? First thing you observe that since the fault is an F 1 stuck at 1, in order to detect it, we have to apply a reverse logic value to A. So, A must be 0. Okay. Regarding B and C, since this is an AND gate, if either B or C is 0, the output will always be 0. So, we cannot detect whether fault A is present or absent. So, B and C must be 1. In fact, for F 1 stuck at 1, this is the only test vector which you can apply. But for F 2, what is the test vector you need? F 2 is the output stuck at 1. So, somehow if you can apply a test vector which can put a 0 on the output, then you would be able to detect this fault, because, un, uh, because under fault free condition it will be 0, if the fault is there it will be 1. For a 3 input AND gate, all the 6, all the in fact all the 7 combinations other than the all 1 combination will give an output 0. So, any of these can be used as a test set. This is shown pictorially here. These are the different um, test vectors. Out of this, this is the test vector for F 1 as I had mentioned and all the 7 test vectors excluding all ones 1 1 1, these will act as the possible test vectors for F 2. Now, in this example, who dominates whom? See, I can say a test for F 1 will also act as a test for F 2, but not the reverse, which means F 2 dominates F 1 and I can remove F 2 from the fault list. Okay. So, for an AND gate, we can well the total number of faults that we need to consider are only 4, stuck at 1 in the input and stuck at 0 either in one of the inputs or you can you can also have stuck at 0 on the output. So, total 4 you need to consider, because if you do not consider dominance it would be 5, 4 uh, sorry for um, 3 input gate 3 here and 1 here. But for dominance, uh, sorry, 5, 2 here, stuck at 0, stuck at 1. But if you also use dominance, the output stuck at 1 also gets removed. So, you have reduced it to 4. In general, for an n input AND gate, if you have an n input AND gate, the number of stuck at 4 that need to be considered are the number of primary inputs plus 1. The same is true for OR, AND, NAND and NOR gates. Okay. So, let us come back to this slide. Uh, here it says that in a tree circuit, the primary input faults form a dominance collapsed fault set. This is an interesting result. Let us try to explain what this means. See, a tree circuit is one where there is no fan out. Suppose I have a circuit like this.
this is an example of a tree circuit, there are no fan outs. Well, here what it says that if you consider only stuck at faults on the inputs, primary inputs, this will constitute a the primary input faults form a dominance collapse fault set. Because you can you can easily see that, is that since there is no fan out, so any stuck at 0 or stuck at 1 fault on the primary input will be dominated by a fault on the primary input that can be removed. Similarly, this can be removed, this can be removed and this can be recursively applied. And from each primary input, there is a single path to the primary output. So, this can be easily shown that if you have a circuit like this, you need to consider only the primary input faults and this faults will constitute or this will cover the faults for the whole circuit. Now, in fact, there is an interesting theorem which helps us in concentrating on which faults to be considered uh, for the test generation. This is based on a concept called checkpoints. Now, checkpoint says that the primary inputs of a circuit and also the fan out branches, these are called checkpoints. And the checkpoint theorem says that a test set that detects all, well single for the time being, ignore multiple now, all single stuck at faults on all checkpoints also detects all single stuck at faults in that circuit. So, it says that if we concentrate only on faults on the checkpoints, that will cover the other faults. This is a very interesting theorem which helps us in redu reducing the number of faults in a very easy way without have to without having to analyze the circuit in a very complex so we can very easily do this now a very simple example to illustrate this suppose you have a circuit like this these are the primary inputs these are the fan out branches these are the fan out branches so there are 10 total checkpoints but total fault sites were 16 so straight away using checkpoint theorem you have reduced the fault site, number of fault sites from 16 to 10. So, in terms of the faults, you have reduced it from 32 to 20. But you should remember that using fault dominance and equivalence, you can possibly reduce the number of faults to even less than 20. But this checkpoint theorem is a useful starting point. Well, so you can very quickly reduce the number of places you need to check before you apply the equivalence and dominance to reduce the number of faults. Uh, so, in this lecture uh, we have talked about the basic problem about testing and some of the fault models. So, we will be continuing with our discussion in the next lecture where we will be looking at some some other fault models, multiple stuck at faults, then the transistor level fault models and then we will be moving on towards the problems like fault simulation, test generation and so on. Thank you.